Welcome to Brandon Avert. We are delighted to be joined by a fellow South African, Teresa Hardman, and we're going to be talking about creative intuition. Teresa, would you like to start with a true story? Yeah, I'd, I'd, there, there are many stories to tell around the, the, the way intuition works during the creative process, but a very famous one is the example of a Flemish scientist whose name was Kekule, who was struggling to determine the structure of the, the benzene molecule. And he wrestled with this rationally. He consulted with his colleagues. He experimented and did all the kind of empirical routes that, that normally happen in the science lab. But one day he had a day, he was daydreaming. He was probably dozing on the couch and he dreamt of, he, he kind of had these kind of fuzzy visions of organisms swallowing other organisms and also very diffuse images of floating atoms. There, there, there was a kind of a, a, a very loose structure to what he was seeing. So he was dreaming about atoms, his field, but it didn't make sense to him made a few notes about it and carried on with his life and his work. And apparently a, a good year or two after that, he actually woke up from a, a dream, a proper sleeping dream. And in that dream, he had seen a vision of a serpent that was actually eating its own tail, which is not something you see or dream about every, every day or every night. And he thought, well, wow, you know, what on earth, this is ridiculous. What could it mean? However, he took it very seriously. He again went back to his notebook and decided to give that vision a chance. And he then pursued that line of investigation and lo and behold, that was actually the solution that he'd been looking for all along, but was unable to find through rational processes. And Albert Einstein also talks often about how he, he felt sort of almost in his body, he felt a muscular sensation of the way something should be, um, and, uh, would pursue it with having no rational explanation for it at all. And then almost post rationalized. So, so those are two interesting examples from science that, that illustrate the way creative intuition works. So I'm interested in the example for lots of reasons. Uh, a personal reason is that I'm a science fiction author who's who's had writer's block for five years. So I haven't written anything new except for some short stories for five years, but I was a full-time author for six years before that and wrote 14 novels and then they dried up. So I'm very curious about this from that perspective, but also the case is interesting for other reasons. So the one is that it's a uh, creativity in science and a lot of people, I don't think associate science with creativity. So they feel that science is a linear process where you start with a set of hypotheses that just come to you instantly and you test and you say, yay, nay, and you just keep doing that. Uh, whereas it sounds like this is a far more, uh, higgledy piggledy process of, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I need to think about this dream about this and ideas come into your head with, that aren't in your control, which is the third element that I find very interesting is that this is outside of your control. And yeah, I, I, I think it's a great case for these reasons. And um, yes, the, the misconception is that, um, science is very much based on intellect and rationalism. And, but as I mentioned, Einstein himself has accredited several of his breakthroughs, including his leaps, which have led us towards quantum physics as being completely led by intuition. And in fact, he himself has, has quoted famously the fact that intuition is, is, is actually regarded as the servant to the master in our society. It's regarded as a servant to intellectualism. It, it, it's kind of secondary. The intellect is regarded as the master in terms of knowing in our society. And he says that, that we have got it all wrong. We, the intuition, it should be the master. And we're sitting in a situation where the, 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 the servant is actually leading the monster. And so, so, and there's a lot of writing on creativity in science. There are several books from the 1960s and the 1970s, which the name escapes me right now, but they were scientists were interviewed and asked as to how they came, how the primary means of investigation was, how it proceeded. And the most kind of impressive advances in science have kind of come about through intuition because by logic alone, you cannot make impressive leaps. You can only, it's an additive process. It's linear it, it, by nature. It, it can't 
leap into another realm or into another framework of, of thinking. It's kind of stuck in its own framework. And that's very often the case in business as well, where business, business minds are very much at the mercy of their own little colloquialism and their own language, even language limits you. So the scientists who allow themselves to dream or to listen to music, that's another thing writers and poets write, uh, talk often or have written about the importance of immersing themselves in, in classical music or going for a long walk. Um, walking is a very common thing amongst various problem solvers as a, a, a means to, to relax the mind and just let go of intellectual grasping because that's what's so limiting. So the filmmaker Orson Welles tried this experiment in the seventies where he decided to dress up like a mystical Swami and he would tell people's fortunes, but knowing that he had no supernatural powers whatsoever. And after doing this for a number of months, this woman walked into his, into his Swami tent and he looked at her and he said to her, I'm so sorry for the loss of your husband. And she burst into tears and she said, how could you possibly know that my husband died? And he sort of thought, you're right. How could I possibly know? I've just met you. And he reflected on this and he realized that this intuitive response really came from months and months of observation so that he was spending time with people who were grieving, often people who are grieving want to kind of know the future or reflect on their, their loved ones who have passed away. And they have certain telltale signs like running mascara or that their nails aren't clean or the color of the outfits that they wear. And over time, once you sort of, you might initially take the observation in and make note of the detail, but the more and more you do that, the more it becomes an automatic response that you are taking in the sense data and you don't need to assess it and sort of compute it. It just becomes an intuitive response. And so I, well, I think, it, sorry, I think it's, I wouldn't say it's as much intuitive as it becomes unconscious and you're not consciously looking for the signs, but you are. Um, unconsciously observing, which might be slightly different to intuition. Sorry, I've interrupted. Yes. Yeah, so that might be something worth talking about. So maybe what I'm describing is not an intuitive process, but some other kind of process, as you say, we're trying to ascertain knowledge in the world and there might be a number of mechanisms for doing so. And so, yeah, if you can differentiate what's going on in the Orson Welles case from what you mean by intuition, that'd be very interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, um, example and I have, and I remember when I first heard of it, I, I had the thought, is this intuition or is it purely unconscious, repetitive observation? And my conclusion was, although, although I'm still open to being intuitive, I never actually come to complete conclusions. So far, I think it's just from years and years or however long he's, he was observing grieving widows, it became almost second nature to him to pick up the telltale signs. And in a way that is a kind of an intuitive knowing because intuition is defined as knowing something without knowing how, but usually like, for example, in the case that we've just been talking about with Albert Einstein and Kekulé, they, he hadn't been observing snakes or he hadn't been the, the snake vision and the other vision of the organisms floating and so on were not something which he was at all familiar with. It literally came from seemingly nowhere. Paul McCartney also in an interview with the BBC watched many years ago where he, he said to an interviewer that he remembers waking one morning with the full song of yesterday, fully formed in his mind, the, the tune, the lyrics, everything. He just had to quickly write it down. So now. How much of that actually comes from our previous experience is questionable. I think part of your in intuition is derived from memory, even repressed memories or long lost childhood memories because our body stores memories. Uh, so, so while you think you can't remember a lot of stuff from your childhood, a lot of it is being carried around in the cells of your body. So these things could come from some childhood experience. So, so the intuition draws from unconscious content, stuff we're not really, um, conscious of in the sense of aware right now, I know this, 
but it also comes from emotion. It comes from our emotional involvement with things. It comes from various sources. So uh, the Orson Welles example, I would say is, I think it is intuitive knowing, but based on repetitive observation. So I want to explore this McCartney case more in a similar case. So the author of Eat, Pray, Love, I think her name is Elizabeth Gilbert. So she tells the story, she has a TED talk on creativity and she tells the story where she says that an idea will come to her and she's sitting in her house, which is in the countryside and there's a hill nearby and she's busy hanging the washing on the line. And there's an idea for a story that she senses coming over the distant hill. And she says, I, I, I feel it sweeping down the landscape towards my house and I have to run to, to the lounge to get a pen and jot that idea down before the idea sweeps across the valley and it's gone. And I've had this experience as well, also waking up with ideas uh, or driving in traffic or in the shower, having an idea for a book and then having to write it down. If I don't write it down, it's gone, it's gone. And the question that I've often wondered when this happens is where does it come from? So you have suggested some ideas that it could come from a distant memory, from memory of your childhood, from something that's imbibed in your body somewhere, but sometimes it just feels like it's otherworldly, like it comes from your muse. I think that's what Elizabeth Gilbert says. She says, I have a muse yeah. runs down the hill. She, she kind of externalizes it. She's this external thing that, that visits her and then goes off and so on. I think she's being a bit melodramatic, especially the the whole sweeping down from the hills and then sweeping you away. It also sells books that kind of talk. But I, in the shower driving, when you're driving long distance, for example, when you hit the road and you, you get that beautiful Karoo landscape and you just get into this rhythm of traveling and your, your normal rhythm has been changed. But yes, it can also happen when you're hanging up the washing. It happens frequently to me while I'm walking the dog. It happens, it happened this morning as soon as I woke up. Also those kind of dreamy states where you're not quite awake and you're not quite asleep. But when the rational mind quietens down, the unconscious stuff is allowed to kind of emerge into consciousness and it, it can be triggered. The, the unconscious little triggers come usually in the form of an image, not very seldom in the form of a word or a sentence, but it's a kind of a, what William James calls an intelligible germ. It's a little thing that kind of pops up out of nowhere. And if you don't take it seriously, it, it just floats and gets forgotten. But the important thing is to take it seriously. I don't believe that it comes from somewhere external. From my understanding and my reading and my years of research, it comes from an engagement with reality. So. It is a combination of this inner world, which is you, which is embodied consciousness, which is as you've been through memories, fantasy, dreams, things you might never have. I mean, inside us, we've got a whole cosmos that nobody knows except us. And we only communicate some of that to people around us. So when your internal cosmos connects with the external cosmos, the external world, there are little reactions that happen and they aren't at the time easily explainable and they might not be explainable for a long time, but I do believe it is your lived experience that you bring along with you. It is also your openness to what you are experiencing in the world. Imagination comes into it. Emotion comes into it. Emotional response to something can trigger an idea. I can, if I'm hanging up my washing, I can look at something and, and see a shape and it reminds me, and if I allow myself to, I can go off into a bit of a reverie and the shape can remind me of something and, and I can allow myself to float with that for a while. It will lead to some sort of an idea, but A, I have to take it seriously. B, I have to follow it. I have to allow to hold this weird kind of not knowing where the hell is this thought going. And that's how it, it grows. And you have to record it, otherwise it's gone. But unfortunately, the, the more you think about or 
you create, the more it, it kind of, it kind of solidifies in you. It kind of becomes cast into concrete because you're thinking about it. The thing about creative block is you have to get out of your head and you have to get into your body. And as Julia Cameron says, you have to just sit down and show up and do whatever it is that you want to do. And you have to be prepared to write absolute nonsense for a long time. I mean, Henry Miller also talks, the, the, the author Henry Miller talks about plunging himself into the sea of uncertainty, not knowing if he was going to sink or swim. And he, he says, normally I do sink and I'm almost drowning, but it's through that that I actually find my way. So that the trick is to get out of the, the rational mind and to get into the doing of it. So you, the way you can get out of the rational mind is either through meditation, in the traditional sense, but not everybody's into that. Exercise is brilliant. Going for a walk, having a shower, chopping vegetables. If, no, that's not exercise, but still, it's kind of repetitive mindless stuff. And that's another thing. You shouldn't listen to podcasts and things all the time and music all the time. You should allow yourself it's it's space while you're doing nothing or while you're thinking of nothing. If you understand what I'm saying, you need to allow your brain to have downtime. And John Keese has actually got a wonderful little book on creativity. He says, we don't lie around and do nothing. We're always busy. And if we're not doing something, we're planning something. And if we're if we are kind of driving, then we've always got a podcast on or put music on, or we've forgotten how to just be. Well, I gather in some of your research, you've spoken to artists of different varieties. So poets, painters, dancers, architects, is there a common structure that you've found with them that leads to successful creative outputs? Despite the endeavor, whether it's scientific or poetic or artistic or dance, there are a couple of common threads. The first is that there must be a willingness to fail. There must be, there must be the, what's the word? You must be able to accept that fear is part of the process. We all feel fear when we're doing something new. We all feel not fear in its greatest sense, but you know, to a degree, we get nervous when we have to do something new or when we're encountering something new, whether it is writing a novel, I, I get nervous every time I start a new drawing or every time I teach or do a presentation or whatever. But I think it's just part of what they call the reptile brain, trying to protect you from any form of novelty. And Georgia O'Keeffe, the painter said that she famously said, I, every time I do something new, I'm terrified, but it has never yet stop me from doing what I want to do. And that is the trick. It's learning to live or, or learning to proceed with a fear. With most of us, we, we feel the fear and we think we're paralyzed and we think, ah, maybe I shouldn't do this. So, so it's this ability to hold uncertainty and be comfortable with uncertainty and not knowing that's really important and being prepared to make an absolute balls up and being prepared to start again. So uh, Shunryu Suzuki talks about in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. So if you have beginner's mind, you're open. It's like, if I had to start a pottery class tomorrow, I know nothing about pottery. Um, now I could approach the pottery class with going and researching and reading and getting, you know, to know as much as I possibly can, and then trying to do the thing in the correct manner. However, I could alternatively go to that pottery class and think, well, what would happen if I had to take the clay and stick it in my ear and turn it and see what happens and then, and try that. Like a child, you need to be prepared to be a child again. And that is whether you're writing, whether you're experimenting and trying to find solutions to problems, you need to be prepared to be stupid. William Kentridge calls his studio a safe space for stupidity. And then you also just need to be prepared to do the work. You need to be prepared to sit down and do it, not think about it. So my experience with this is complex because I started with a beginner's mind when I started writing science fiction. I have a degree in English literature, so I've read literature, but it wasn't a degree that taught me how to write. It just taught me how to read. And there were a lot of books when I first started writing 
on writing, like Stephen King's on writing, which is very well known. And I refused to read any of them because I wanted to do it my way, which I guess is quite obstinate, but I think it's part of why I was a good writer initially, or at least I thought I was a good writer initially. But over time, I subscribed to a lot more writers groups online. I read a lot more about writing and it taught me a lot about how to structure your writing time in a way that makes it very productive. So I don't know if you're aware that there's a lot of writers, there's a, the biggest Facebook group for writers is called 20 books to 50 K. And the idea is to make a living of $50,000 a year, you need to produce 20 books. And these writers have this idea of producing a book monthly. So they write a novel monthly in my first few years. I was producing a novel every six months or so. It was a very relaxed process. It felt very good. I was doing it full time. So I really used to percolate in the ideas and it was a lovely experience. But the last uh, two years, I, I wrote 10 books and I, I produced them roughly every two, two months and a bit. And it burned me out. I couldn't write after that. And I think part of that experience was, as you say, stepping into expert mind. So I had all these rules about what makes good writing and bad writing and how to structure your time. And I wish I could get back to the days when I had no rules, when it wasn't structured at all. And I could approach it with a beginner's mind. And I just found that too many rules uh, screws up the process. I think also kind of you, you did so, you wrote so prolifically for that time. You feel as though like you, you'll never be able to repeat it. It's kind of Elizabeth Gilbert talks about, you know, in, when she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, it's like, how the hell do I ever write anything again after a book like that? So you kind of, your standards are so freaking high and you're very aware of it. So you're constantly judging yourself against what you did and how fantastically you did and how fantastically all these other people are doing. Every month they're writing a book. And one of the things about intuition is it has to operate from an ego free zone. And the, your ego is the part of you. It's the sense of the narrow, small cap, small letter S that sees, you see yourself as an isolated individual compared with everybody else who you see as isolated individuals and separate. And when you are, are in that kind of intellectual ego consciousness, you are thinking about what you have done in the past. You're thinking about what others are doing. You're comparing, you're paralyzing your creative energy substantially. Whereas if you, and it's not easy to drop ego. I mean, Mark, we spoke about it in my workshop, you know, how do you get out of ego mode? But it, it's, it's essentially what is needed is to forget yourself. Forget everything you've done, forget everything that you, forget everything that your heroes are doing and just immerse yourself in the moment. Suzuki talks about burning yourself like a good bonfire so that there is nothing left of yourself. And when you operate like that, you, whatever it is that you're embarking on, whether it's a novel or a painting or a, a business plan or whatever, it, you, it's you see the vastness of your entire life and the universe. And this little thing is actually so in insignificant. It releases you of quite a lot of fear, but when you pump it up with, you know, I have to achieve what I achieved before. And you put all this, this judgment comparison and pressure on yourself, it's going to paralyze you. So you kind of have to, in your head, get into a space of, I don't give a damn if it works. I don't give a damn if it doesn't work, I'm going to see what happens. It's kind of casting yourself into an ocean and not knowing where you're going, but being very open. And obviously it's normally driven by some sort of initial idea or a spark, which makes you want to do the drawing or write the, the book or write the poem or whatever. And that is what you need to hang on to. And, and it's you and that energy that, that needs to just free flow and without any, any kind of societal pressure or need for approval and success. It's easier said than done. So if I reflect on my own creative process as a lawyer, it requires a fair amount of different kinds of outputs of standing up and performing in court or, you know, writing up argument. The first thing I think is you actually have to have the skills. So you have to know your material. And I would think that's going to be the case in a whole range of fields to be a creative scientist requires 
knowing the fundamental tenets of science. To be a good dancer means putting in the hard yards of developing the techniques and having the physical strength for it. I think then, as you allude to that element of being open, of being able to say, well, there's a thing I'm trying to do, and maybe there's a whole range of possibilities that we can entertain. And so I'm often doing that in conjunction with someone else. I'm debating the ideas with the client or with, with colleagues, and we're thinking about a range of things. The other one that you've alluded to is then doing something else, allowing that idea to incubate, to be able to see it as a seed that can grow without you scrutinizing it too heavily. And then I think at some juncture, once you start going through the, the writing process or the performance process, you need to have that ability to assess its quality, to be ruthless and to say, well, I've written this thing out and some of it is good and some of it is awful and the awful needs to be trimmed away. But as you say, if you go in with a, with an overtly skeptical approach, you'll never make a thing in the first place. So having the filter come in at the right stage seems absolutely vital. Yeah, you can't create and, and edit at the same time. I, I can't remember where, when I was actually writing my pieces, I was, I had complete stage fright and writer's block and all those things. And I remember someone said, I, I read somewhere, someone, someone said, just write madly and then edit like a judge, but they are separate processes. You have to first just get it all out there and then you come back and you filter and you, and you select and you, you take stuff away and you combine other things, but you have to, the intellect has to come after the intuition. You can never start with intellectual thought processes and let it lead into intuition. You have to start off with an intuitive response and that has to be no holds barred. It has to be absolutely authentic and sincere and stupid and free and uncensored. And after that, when you've got all this compost out there and then you pick and you, and you edit, but you can't go the other way around. And now getting back to you, your comment about the skill, you're quite right. Skill is so important because while you're learning a craft or um, a skill like your, your legal skills, you're constantly checking, am I doing it right? Or how do you do this again? Uh, like as a painter with, you know, which brush do I use? Should I mix this color with that color? The more experience you have in your, with your medium, whether it's speaking in court or writing a novel or choreographing, the, the broader your vocabulary is, the, the deeper your experience is, the more easily you can let go of that and then trust your intuition. But you have to know the, 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 the medium in order to be able to relax into using it intuitively. Something I've experienced which I think is going to be very unpopular. I imagine you're not going to like it. And I, I've never met any creatives who like this position, but it, it really is my experience from my own work is that not all creativity is equally valuable or equally good. So there is a position amongst creative people, which is that creativity comes from who you are. It's always good. It's always good to express it. It's always good. But that's just not my experience with both my own creativity and others. Some creativity is just bad. And yes, you could say, well, in the edit, you can fix it up or discard the stuff that's bad and keep the good stuff. But I just, I feel like, and, and I'm trying to get to a, a creative point here or a positive point here, which is that it seems like there's certain creative states which will produce better work. So the state that I was in, in the first few years of writing was a slower state where the ideas had more time to percolate. Whereas in my later few years, I was in this rush to push it's out. Like it was, it was creative. I, I came yeah. up with lots of ideas, they flowed, but there was something magical missing that was present in the first few years. And I got that feedback from readers. I, I developed a very strong readership in the first few years that loved my work and read everything I put out. And in the last few years, they said, but there's something missing. It's creative. They can't put their finger on it, but there's something missing. And I felt like certain creative states were just more valuable. 
exactly what those are, I'm not sure. There's certainly a time component. Giving it time is important. But beyond that, I'm not too sure what it is. There's no denying that stuff that is like paintings or songs that are produced, they're creative because creativity is essentially bringing something new into existence, but it, it is something which has value. And obviously value is something which will be different to you and different to me. But the way something resonates with your readers is the value and you, you yourself could feel it. You, you, well, you were getting feedback from your readers, but I know when I'm doing a drawing, I know when it's fantastic and I know when it's okay. Um, doesn't matter what other people say about it. Afterwards, I can, I kind of judge for myself, but it, it is definitely to do with the state that you're in and the value that people get from the creative output is in the way it makes them feel. What meaning does it have to them? Does it, is it thought provoking? Does it have kind of multiple layers of meaning? Does it make them want to go and do something? It sparks off something in the, the receiver, whether it's the reader or the viewer or whatever. And so it's that interpersonal connection, which is really hard to define, but that is what makes one artwork profound and another not. It makes it kind of mediocre. So, so that is the, the first kind of response to your, your statement that, that not all creative output is good. And I agree with that. And there are degrees of connection, but it, it also depends on who's on the receiving end. So that's quite a, a loose thing. But then getting back to your time, time is so important in terms of allowing intuition to emerge and to develop and to play a role in the creative process. The intellect can be forced and the intellect is all about intentionally ordered thought. It's thought that you direct, you're the, the kind of the conductor of the orchestra and you tell yourself to think in a certain way and add up things or whatever. And you can confine that to specific periods of time, but intuition requires extended periods of time because intuition, as I said earlier, means that you're drawing from memories, emotions. It, it's a combination of conscious, unconscious, all sorts of cues that are coming at you and through you. And when you're in the process of writing or painting or drawing, extended periods of solitude are so important because in that time when you're alone, you're uninterrupted. You don't have a time limit. Like I have to stop in an hour's time or whatever. If, if you can kind of put a timer on so that you don't think about the time and then allow yourself to swim for that hour, it's great. But if you're constantly thinking, oh, I have to go and I have to remember to do this. If you're in, in the time zone, you're not in flow, which is the, the well-known term, then you are constantly interrupting the weaving together of conscious, unconscious, plus the, the, your skills that are coming into play. But there's so many, there's so many layers involved in making something. It's not just a rational process. It's not just a technical process. It's rational. It's technical. It's emotional. It's intuitive. So many different things and it requires weaving and that weaving requires extended time. So maybe that is one of the reasons why you're battling, um, and maybe you're putting too much pressure on yourself. I would, my, my suggestion to you would be to first forget about a novel, just play, just write, play with words, just let words become a play thing that you start to have fun with, start to really enjoy and combine in interesting ways and see where that takes you and so that it releases you from this kind of job of writing a novel. Does that make sense? So Woody Allen is one of the most prolific filmmakers uh, of all time. He would produce a film uh, almost every year for the last 50 years and very interesting uh, approach to work. So his character on screen is hyper neurotic and very concerned about what everybody else thinks, but the man of Woody Allen isn't like that at all. So he had a relentless pursuit towards completion. 
And he was involved in every single stage of the film production from writing and it's acting to editing. And he said that what he would do is focus solely on that project, immerse himself in it completely and utterly. So 10 hours a day of work. And once it was done, he would never give a, another thought to it. So he never read any reviews. He wouldn't accept awards. He won an Oscar for Annie Hall, which I don't think he accepted on stage. He disregarded the praise. He disregarded the criticism. And he just said, I must focus on the next project. And he would continually do that. And because of that, he was able to produce a large number of films. He said he could never predict whether a film would be successful or not. He just liked the fact that they were financially successful enough on average that he could keep making them. But he had no way of knowing for himself whether he would make a lot of money, whether it would be popular. He said occasionally he would take a guess and he would almost be totally wrong. So it seems like being able to shut your mind off to a range of things is very useful for creative output. Okay. The other sort of... The other sort of story that I'd like to talk about is how people have used strange creative games to produce work. So you mentioned this idea of like falling in love with words, and maybe there's ways people can do that that are unusual. So one of the, the famous games that I think the beat poets would play with is to write out a line of poetry, fold it up, and then pass it on to someone else. Um, or you get these sort of beautiful corpse drawings where you only have limited amounts of information. Dali would fall asleep with a spoon in his hand. And as soon as the spoon okay. hit something metal beneath him, it would wake him up and he would be brought out of this liminal space and create. So can you tell us a bit about the, the power of those processes? Yeah, no, those uh, the surrealists were, were the guys who, who developed, or I've actually got a wonderful book of surrealist games for writing and drawing, and they, they literally took the seriousness or well, they made everything just a game. And, and I mean, it was, I think it was Oscar Wilde. He said, life is too important to be taken seriously. I mean, we need to just have fun. And it, it, it's when we have fun, we relax. And when we relax, then, then intuitive stuff can come through. The, you mentioned Woody Allen and the fact that he was so prolific, he focused, there's a common advice that was certainly given to me as an art student was focus on quantity, not quality, focus on making 10 drawings of a subject, not just one perfect drawing of, of a still line. Let yourself go. Don't be so precious about the one thing that you, that you're doing. And Woody Allen's thing of not listening to the reviews and not listening to the, not worrying about awards and so on is actually quite unusual because what drives most people in the creative industry are, are awards and reviews and so on. But if you can get into a, a space where those things don't really matter to you and you find that when you read about the, 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 the really sort of guys who made creative leaps like Andy Worrell as well, he once said to, to students, he said, get in there and make art. Don't worry whether it's good or bad or anything. While other people are deciding whether it's good or bad, just carry on and make more. So this thing of not taking ourselves so freaking serious is really important. And seeing ourselves as this tiny little dot in this huge freaking cosmos. You know, when you look at Hubble telescope, it just puts everything into perspective. We are not, the, the, but the, that's where ego comes in. It's the, the self-importance. And when you focus on your self-importance and what other people think the, you, you kind of, you're almost like you're blocking that, that conduit, that, that hose part of energy. It's creative energy. It's, it's universal. Up in, when in my creativity coaching, I talk about creative energy is actually the, the, the law of nature. If you look at, you look at the trees, the animals, the, the sky, the rivers, everything exists to create, to make more and it unfolds and it expands and yes, it dies, but it becomes fodder for more. And that, and if we see ourselves as an integral part of that system of nature, we are just conduits of natural creative energy. And when you start seeing it that way and you realize that you're not important, you're just a freaking, let it come through you. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. And you're very often surprised if you do approach it that way. So you and Mark both mentioned the surrealists and it made me think about Freud. So Freud was a big fan um, of the surrealists and I'm curious what the psychoanalytic or psychodynamic accounts of creativity are like, what they think makes someone creative. 
I actually had a big argument with my, my supervisor about this when I was doing my research. He, he was adamant that you can't access the unconscious at will. And Freud was of that opinion. Freud was of the opinion that you can, the, the, the unconscious can only reveal itself in the form of dreams and Freudian slips. And it's normally repressed stuff that you're ashamed of or that you've kind of hidden, buried. Whereas Jung to Jung, the unconscious is everything that you have not consciously appropriated. You have not identified, you haven't singled it out from the myriad of things in your existence and thought about it. So, so if you think about it that way, 99.9% .9 of our existence, we, we are unconscious of because we, we cannot give attention, either awareness or time to reflect on it, or we, we, we can't do that to everything. So. There's a lot of unconscious information that we've noticed, not necessarily rationally, but, but we have absorbed information without even being aware of it. And, and we might not even be able to verbalize it. We might not even, even be able to understand or describe it. But so that, that unconscious information Jung regarded as a kind of storehouse of latent potential stuff that is there within us always that when it emerges, when we relax our intellect and allow it to, to emerge through strange thoughts or dreams or crazy ideas, then we, we can really be surprised with, with where that might lead, but, but we have to take those things quite seriously. Yeah. So, so the unconscious is, is something which I spent a lot of time trying to understand. I mean, even just consciousness as a word, just trying to understand what is consciousness. That is like a, a minefield, depending on whether you're a neuroscientist or a philosopher or a spiritual guru. Consciousness has so many definitions. And Jung developed a, a method called active imagination, where he encouraged in encounters with, with novel situations or any kind of new experience. He in encouraged that encounter and he said that in the encounter with some novelty or strangeness or uncertainty, there is going to be a lot of discomfort, but it is allowing yourself to sit in that discomfort, the, the, the kind of the fusion happens and the imagination then starts becoming active, but you have to be prepared to sit in discomfort and not knowing. So I wonder what your view is on creative collaboration. So traditionally, when we think about an artist, we think about them on their own, sitting away in a cabin or writing or, you know, in their painter's studio, but there's certain kinds of art forms that require you to collaborate with others. So filmmakers typically have to work with a cast with a range of technicians and you can cross influence each other. And some people might not like that. They might think that the purity of the vision is diluted and others will say that in those uncomfortable interactions, there's a certain synergy that emerges. And um, you think about someone like William Kentridge, you know, I think he's most famous for his paintings, but you know, he's cross collaborated with musicians, with puppeteers, with a range of people. And I think that's pushed him to do things that he might not have otherwise done. And is probably one of the reasons why he's internationally regarded as a, a genius of an artist. Yes, yes. So collaboration is, as you say, obviously in in some disciplines like filmmaking, it's essential. You can't do it on your own. So then it is about that word you use, synergy, you know, really becoming aligned to a common purpose. And I spoke about extended periods of solitude. I think that would apply to extended periods of solitude for the group. So that synergy can really mesh. And if you're all on the same wavelength and you're all tolerant of ambiguity and uncertainty and what, I mean, he treats operas. I know he would sometimes take images and display them with music. And then he would take the same image and use a different piece of music. He, he was constantly in his creative process, being open and fluid and before deciding on, on the final solution. So then obviously the people you work with have to be tolerant of, of that uncertainty and have to allow that, that chaos with where they say Nietzsche said. You can't give birth to a dancing star without chaos. And so even in a group that, that chaos needs to be held and valued and, and nurtured. And out of that comes the dancing star. 